the radical. Fundamental principles of freedom, rational self-interest, and individual rights. This is the Yaron Brook Show. All right, everybody, welcome to Yaron Brook Show on this uh, Monday, April 15th. It's tax day. I hope everybody has filed their extension or filed their taxes. Well, I hope you found a way not to, but I, I, I think you're better off filing than uh, going to uh, jail. All right, we've got, we've got our first uh, chatter announcing to the world that Christ is King. Um, if only I'd realized that earlier, maybe my life would be different. I think it's a little too late for me, Cal, so uh, don't, waste, don't waste your energy on me. Um, all right, uh, <laughs> let's see. All right, today, so we're going to do a, uh, a roundup of uh, the, what happened with Iran and Israel and what's happening and what I expect to happen in the next few days. We'll talk about U.S. aid to Israel because that always becomes a big issue. America supporting Israel and God supporting, um, well, God uh, or Christ or whatever. Uh, and then um, <laughs> I guess I guess my 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 uh, my followers on uh, my followers on um, on the chat are getting into this. Chris, Christ is King. Chris is King. You know, somebody's King. I mean, who, who, yeah. Um, anyway, uh, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the, do the gold, some interesting news about gold. And then um, we'll talk about homicide rates. I've got some numbers. So far, I've just been talking about directions. Now we've got some numbers. Came out over the weekend about 2024. So we'll talk about that, the first quarter of 2024. All right. Oh, now, Christie's king. Who, who is Christie? God, I mean, this uh, king issue is out of control. Out of control. Adam says he is king. All right, uh, let's put that to rest. Ein is queen. All right, I, I, that one, I, that, that I'm on with you. I'm with you on that. Uh, let's see. All right, let's uh, talk about uh, the Iranian attack on Israel. Um, I think many of you heard my show that I did while the attack was going on on, um, uh, on Saturday. Uh, it was a five-hour show. I think I broke all the records. I think Jonathan Honing... Uh, uh, finally got what he wanted. He wanted a three-plus-hour show, and he got a five-hour show on Saturday. But it was all kind of real time, so we, we were tracking what I was tracking what was going on, trying to inform you of it, um, and uh, and uh, so now we can we can kind of summarize what actually happened. We have the data, we have uh, the knowledge, uh, free of kind of fog of war uh, elements uh, in terms of what was on uh, what was going on. All right. So bottom line is uh, the Iranians launched, the Iranians and some Iranian proxies, Iranian proxies in Iraq um, and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, the Houthis as well as uh, Hezbollah in uh, Lebanon all launched various uh, projectiles towards Israel. Uh, overall, in terms of at least the, the larger projectiles, I think the, the Hezbollah launched some of their short-range missiles into Israel. But... Overall, we're talking about 170 drones, 170, 30 30 cruise missiles. And what surprised me ultimately, because you didn't really get this sense uh, uh, when things were actually happening in real time, uh, there were 120 ballistic missiles, 120 ballistic missiles. Uh, you know, the, the, in terms of uh, the, the hit rate, um, of 170 drones, zero actually impacted Israel. Of the 30 cruise missiles, zero actually hit Israel. Of the 120 ballistic missiles, something like uh, seven uh, hit uh, the southern area in Israel, the, 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 uh, the Negev. Uh, I think uh, mostly uh, two Air Force bases were hit, one aircraft was damaged, no casualties in those Air Force bases. One aircraft was damaged, it was a refueling airplane, uh, a maintenance hut, and, and a few craters in the runway, which have since been filled in. So the bases are fully, fully functional. Uh, the one, uh, one ballistic missile did hit a, um, a, a kind of a Druze uh, sediment, a Druze, not a Druze, God, where does that come from? A Bedouin, 
Bedouin uh, settlement. Um, and uh, 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 what do you call it? Um, uh, uh, fragments from it uh, hit a, uh, a, a number of residents there lately, but one girl, seven years old, uh, was was injured uh, significantly from it and experienced uh, had to go over had to go through uh, critical surgery. Uh, as far as I know, she's okay, but I haven't really kept up with that story. Uh, shrapnel, thank you. I was looking for that word, shrapnel. Uh, she was hit with significant shrapnel, uh, went through surgery in Israeli hospital. This is a Muslim girl uh, in, a, in a Bedouin village outside of Arad, outside of a, a, a Jewish uh, town called Arad. Uh, so this is, uh, 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 you know, overall, given uh, that uh, 320 uh, significant projectiles were sent uh, towards Israel. That is a pretty damn good uh, performance in terms of uh, minimal casualties and almost no uh, structural or, uh, or damage to, to anything of importance. Uh, you know, of the uh, of the drones and cruise missiles, most of them uh, were knocked down before they even reached Israel. So most of them were docked, knocked down over. Uh, the Red Sea, if they came from the Houthis or over uh, Jordan and um, and Syria, if they came from Iran, uh, the uh, the people doing the knocking all of these missiles down. I mean, this is a unbelievable performance of uh, of the uh, air defense systems. I mean, this is truly stunning achievement. Basically, ninety nine percent, you know, was knocked down or landed in uh, in the middle of nowhere. So this is truly uh, stunning in terms of uh, the achievement here. But it is a uh, it is not purely an Israeli achievement. A number of ballistic missiles, probably five or six, were shot down uh, from uh, uh, U.S. Navy ships in the eastern Mediterranean. Um, it, you know, I think one uh, of the cruise missiles or, or, or other missiles were knocked down by a, an American ship in the, um, in the Red Sea. Uh, American pilots, um, American pilots, Jordanian pilots, uh, UK pilots, as well as French pilots, all participated in basically what looked like a video game, but a lethal one, of shooting down drones and cruise missiles uh, well before they reached Israel, and the success rate of shooting those down was 100%. That is, uh, is F-35s, American F-35s, uh, and Israeli F-35s basically did most of the work here. And it, it truly is stunning the degree to which uh, they succeeded in knocking all this down. Now, we'll get to the implications of this uh, multilateral uh, mission in a minute. But, uh, but, you know, this is just to give you a sense of actually uh, what happened. It really does look like this attack by the Iranians was modeled after uh, Russian attacks on Ukraine. That is, this is uh, this was a, a pattern developed by the Russians in attacking Ukraine. You send uh, you send drones, cruise missiles, and only at the end ballistic missiles to overwhelm the uh, uh, defense systems. Of course, Ukraine has nowhere nowhere near as good of an air defense system as Israel does. And of course, uh, Ukraine did not have the support of all these allies in, uh, in knocking down, in knocking down the, uh, uh, the, the, the missiles uh, projected at it. Um, so the, the expectations and the plan in terms of the Iranians was for all of these projectiles to reach Israel at about the same time. And that was, uh, that was, somewhat, uh, that was somewhat achieved. Um, uh, let's see again. This is a uh, this is a system developed by uh, the Russians. I don't think uh, they've ever uh, you've ever seen this magnitude of um, uh, the, just the sheer number of drones, cruise missiles, and ballistic missiles all fired at once. That is all fired towards a, a one target. Even in Ukraine, I don't think they've seen these magnitudes. So uh, uh, this was uh, this was definitely. Uh, definitely spectacular. I mean, and think about the fact that in Ukraine, they managed uh, to uh, shoot down about 46% of the, uh, 
of Russian ballistic missiles. Uh, Israel shot down, uh, again, with the help of, of uh, some help from the American Navy, uh, what is it, uh, 113 out of 120, well, 120, but it's not clear that 120 were actually launched. We'll get to that in a minute. Well, or 120 were attempted to be launched. There's also some news coming out that says that about, a, about half of all the ballistic missiles that uh, Iran launched actually either exploded on launch or actually crashed somewhere in Iran or in Iraq, so never even made it uh, anywhere near Israel. So I, I don't know. We don't have accurate stats here, so we don't know. But it could be that up to 50% of all the missiles launched towards Israel never even made it. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, so Israel knocked down well over 90% of what was uh, targeted. Uh, if only 46%, if, if the ratio was closer to the Russian ratio, to the Ukrainian ratio, uh, the damage in Israel would have been substantial. If drones and cruise missiles would have made it, the damage would have been su substantial. I mean, these stories coming out, and I'm seeing them all over the media saying, oh, Iran didn't do this, this wasn't serious, this was just a, this is just a, an, a you don't launch 300 and something uh, missiles and, and drones um, and not be serious about it. They expected significant damage. This is a massive disappointment to them. Uh, it reveals the extent of which the Israeli defense system is dramatically better than the Ukrainian. I think the Russians are watching this too. And this suggests that, again, Americans, NATO, Israel, have capabilities that uh, Ukraine doesn't even come close to. Israel in particular, because it also has the arrow systems, um, is in a particular good position to defend itself against launches. Now, uh, the Iranians did not launch any hypersonics, which is supposedly in Ukraine, the Russians are using close to hypersonic or somewhat hypersonic. Uh, but Israel does have the Arrow 3. The Arrow 3 was designed to deal with hypersonic uh, uh, missiles. It is the only, uh, the only air defense system currently operational and active that was designed to address the issue of hypersonic missiles. Uh, it, w it wasn't really tested, although you did see some Arrow 3 putting down uh, some um, uh, ballistic missiles uh, from Iran, but those were not uh, hypersonic b ballistic missiles. So Israel does have the capacity to pull down hypersonic, um, hypersonic being more than Mach 1, although uh, some of the hypersonics, particularly the Chinese hypersonics, supposedly can deal with uh, Mach 5. Uh, the Arrow 3 has not been tested at those speeds, uh, and I doubt it will be tested anywhere, anywhere, anytime soon. So the hypersonics exceed Mach 5, at least the ones from China. I don't think the Russians do. I think the Russians are much slower. Uh, and uh, the Patriot systems have had, Patriot anti-aircraft systems have had some decent success in knocking down some of the Russian hypersonics. But again, the Russian hypersonics are not Mach 5. They're much lower than that. So, so okay, technically, hypersonic means Mach 5. In reality, you hear a lot about Russia launching hypersonic. They're not Mach 5, the hypersonics the Russian are launches. Iran claims to have hypersonic. It's not the Mach 5, right? It's, it's, it's slower than that. Anyway, um, so that is what happened. Uh, let's see, what else did I want to say about what happened? Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, uh, this is an amazing uh, testament. This is an amazing testament uh, to the air defense system that Israel has. It's an amazing testament to Israeli, American, and other fighters. Supposedly the daughter of the Jordanian king who is an Air Force pilot, knocked down like five drones, so good for her. Um, so uh, a, a huge, uh, huge achievement here. Uh, again, not clear how much, how many of the ballistic missiles actually made it off of their, you know, across the Iranian border in any significant way. Many of them were duds and failed, just as I would expect. Um, uh, we have seen some of the ballistic missile uh, carriages, the kind of the, the holes uh, 
there's one, I saw a video of one that was down near the Red Sea, uh, near the uh, uh, Dead Sea, and one that we saw in Jordan, a video of one in Jordan. Uh, but again, uh, the Arrow system did amazingly well. Uh, the American systems did amazingly well. Uh, it, 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 you know, a few did get through, and I'm sure Israel is looking into why those did get through, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, what, what failed to make it possible for them to get through. So Israel will learn from that and advance. Um, here is the one, I don't know, you, this, is, this is an issue that you've got to, that Israel, I think, uh, is um, unfortunately... Um, I, I think has to deal with. The reality is that Israel got a lot of help. It's not clear what would have happened if Israel hadn't gotten that help. I almost wish Israel didn't get the help. Now, in a, in a, in a proper world, Israel would not only get, get the help, but America would have already you know, eradicated the Iranian regime by now. So I, I'm not talking about an ideal world. I'm talking about in this world. In this world, I'm not sure it was a good thing for Israel to get the help, even if it had meant some of the missiles getting through. The reality is that because of this help that Israel received, it now seems it now feels obligated to those who gave it help: the Americans, the Europeans, and the Arabs in the region. All of these players have come out explicitly, explicitly, right, uh, with statement saying that um, they want Israel not to retaliate. The Biden administration has been very explicit about Israel should not retaliate. This is a win because there were no casualties except for the seven-year-old girl, girl, and it's, you know, what do you want to get into tit for tat, and we don't want to escalate, and please don't respond. The Europeans have said the same thing. Arab nations have said the same thing. And now within Israel, you're seeing uh, leftist publications like Haaretz, which is the equivalent of the New York Times in Israel, saying basically uh, the same thing. Uh, and Israel now feels beholden. So uh, even in Israeli cabinet, they are now talking about, well, how do we maintain this alliance? We formed this alliance. This alliance is great. We now have the Americans and the British and even the Jordanians and the Saudis may have helped and all these other, the Gulf states gave us intelligence. How do we maintain this alliance? And then placing the maintenance of this alliance as questionable as it might be, above the need to retaliate, above the need to respond. That has become the priority. And indeed, it appears that Israel might, will probably respond, but probably respond in a minimal fashion. Now, this is, this is a disaster. Iran just launched 300 and some projectiles towards Israel. I mean, significant projectiles, not, not the little stuff that Hamas even launches, but significant projectiles that could have caused massive damage in Israel. Indeed, there's no question that both the Iranians and the Russians who are helping them will learn from their inability to penetrate Israelis' air defense systems and do a better job or try to do a better job next time. The fact that a few missiles did get through is a real concern. Imagine if those five, seven missiles had hit Tel Aviv or Haifa. There would be significant civilian casualties. So, you know, uh, 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 Israel, by not responding, by not responding, is basically telling Iran that, you know, they can bomb Israel at will. They're telling Iran that they fear them because they fear the response to Israel retaliation. They're telling Iran that their attack on them was effective, will silence Israel. 
They're telling Iran that Israel is beholden to other powers and won't pursue its own self-interest because the Biden administration has asked it not to. Israel can fight alone. It can. You know, I don't know how to dispel this mythology. Maybe this is one of the problems of all these countries coming to Israel's aid. I mean, yes, there would be more casualties. Yes, there could be more, would be more casualties, no question. But Israel can fight and win alone. And indeed, I would argue it needs to fight and win alone, given how meek, given how pathetic, given how appeasing the rest of the world is. Israel should have told the United States and the UK to stand down. It's got this. It should have told them that after October 7th. Please provide us with weapons, which we will buy, by the way. And other than that, leave us alone. Let us manage this thing. We will defend ourselves. It's not too much. It is doable. The Iranians are weak. Hezbollah right now is weak. Hamas is weak. Israel has the resources, capabilities to strike back and defeat the enemies it faces. Now, without foreign help, casualties would be significantly higher, okay? With foreign help, casualties are going to be much higher than otherwise in the long run. In the short run, lower casualties. In the long run, higher casualties. As I've said over and over and over again for 20 years now, Netanyahu is a wimp. There were people within the cabinet who were urging an immediate strike the same night as the Iranian offensive. And that's what should have happened. Now, Israel is looking for strategic alternatives. Every day they meet, the cabinet meets, and they're presented with different alternatives, and Netanyahu says, no, no, give me more alternatives, including, by the way, now they're talking about maybe they'll just do a cyber attack. I mean, maybe they could do a major cyber attack that really made a difference. We will see. Netanyahu is dithering as he has from October 7th, as he has since he became prime minister 20 years ago, almost 20 years ago, dithering, 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 and instead of protecting Israeli lives, instead of securing Israel's security for the long run, he's appeasing the Americans, he's appeasing the Israeli left, he's who hate him anyway, who's playing games, he is. I think the only conclusion is that he is a coward. Who gives a great speech, but never lives up to it. So now the Washington Post's headline says, is there a way to strike on Iran to, quote, send a message while preserving the alliance? You see, the alliance is shackles. The alliance are false friends because real friends would tell them, take the Iranians out. The alliance is a false sense of security. What happens when you become dependent on them and one day they disappear? So, um, uh, unfortunately, this is what Israel is doing. Unfortunately, Israel will suffer the consequence of this. Uh, by the way, they have already announced that they put on hold the operation in Rafa until they take care of the Iranians, but they won't guarantee when they'll take care of the Iranians sometime. So everything is kind of on hold. I, I, I don't know. Israeli economy is suffering dramatically from the fact that everybody is in uh, the army. They've just called up two additional army brigades. 
from uh, reserve brigades, which means even fewer people in the in the workforce. Uh, the economy struggling. Israel spending. You know how much Israel spent on defending itself. Uh, some estimates put it at north of one billion dollars in one evening, one night, in a few hours, to knock down all those Iranian missiles. One billion dollars. It's much cheaper to be on the offensive than it is on the defensive. One billion dollars. Israel can't afford to do this and shutter its economy. Israel needs, and I've said this since October 7th, it needs to win this quickly, decisively, and go back to normal life. And they refuse to do it. And yes, you can blame Biden for it, but that's just, that's pathetic. Every single American president in all of American-Israeli relationships since 1967, since America started selling Israel weapons, 1967, late 1967, has urged Israel to compromise, sell out every single American president, Republican or Democrat. So the fact that Bibi chose to capitulate as some other Israeli prime ministers have in the past, in spite of knowing the consequence of that capitulation, is a sign of his weakness. Golda Meir did not capitulate. So it's a sign of his weakness. You want to blame everything on Biden because you hate Biden and because he's a, he's a left? Fine. But uh, that's just stupidity on steroids. Um, uh, all right, let's see. So I've seen a lot of uh, people complaining about uh, Israel foreign aid. And, you know, I don't like foreign aid. I wish it all went away. Uh, total foreign aid uh, that the United States provides in the world is $77 billion. In, um, it provides foreign aid to 212 uh, countries. Uh, by the way, the United States provides Russia with $1.7 million of foreign aid. It provides South Africa with $659 million in foreign aid. You know, and, and Ethiopia, Ethiopia, by the way, gets $2 billion of foreign aid, just to give you just a sense, um, a sense of it. Luckily, Iran does not get foreign aid, and neither does Australia. Um, and neither does Sweden or, or Finland, but almost any other country in the world gets some form of foreign aid uh, from the United States. I mean, Mongolia gets 17 million, um, and Afghanistan, you know, I, I don't think they get anything now, but they were getting well over a billion. Uh, so here you have, uh, so we have a $70 billion budget. Uh, first, I mean, I'd like to see that zero, but first, uh, let's be clear, $70 billion out of a over $4 trillion budget, $4 trillion, Canada gets a little bit of foreign aid. Canada gets like $32 million of foreign aid. Now, I haven't dug in to figure out what it looks like, what, what it means. There are all kinds of these buckets that foreign aid comes out of. But $70 billion out of a 4 to $5 trillion budget is pretty insignificant. So if we care about government spending, which I do, care about government spending, then the first thing you want to do is cut where it matters. Cut where it matters. Cut where you can get to trillions, right? Trillions. So of the 90 billion, Israel actually receives, I mean, put aside Ukraine um, uh, during the war, which has received about 12 billion, uh, 12 billion, uh, this, this was in 2022, right? So these are, I don't know if we have 2023 numbers. It's just, I'm just looking. 2023 numbers are actually lower, actually 56 billion. So, uh, uh, you know, for what, for what that's worth, um, and let, let me see if they have 2024 numbers. I'm curious. Uh, no, 
So the 2024 numbers are not, I don't have them. So 2023, it was 56 million. Again, I'd like to see these zero, right? Um, and in 2023, it's clear that Russia, for example, is getting nothing, right? Um, so I'd like to see this again at, at zero, but let's start looking at is Israel foreign aid. Just to give you a sense, Egypt today gets what, about 1.5 billion. Uh, Jordan gets 1.6 billion, and in those both of those countries get the foreign aid as part of uh, the peace deals that they struck with Israel. The United States uh, uh, secured the foreign aid. Syria, Syria, a major enemy of the United States, gets 70, 761 million, and Iraq, another enemy of the United States, gets 363 million. Again, as we said, South Africa gets hundreds of millions. Sudan gets 642 million. Uh, I, I don't know, uh, who do we have here? Somalia, Somalia gets a billion dollars of foreign aid. A billion dollars. So Israel gets 3.3. .3. Okay, I found this on the web. Uh, didn't ask you, Siri. Israel gets 3.3, .3, which is, uh, except for Ukraine, the largest amount anybody gets, right? So uh, a significant amount of money, and people are flipping out uh, Israel gets foreign aid, uh, you know, we should cut off Israel from all foreign aid. We should eliminate it completely. And, you know, I, I would not object to that. But let's think about the foreign aid that Israel gets. Now, in the past, during the 19th, starting, in, uh, starting really with the, uh, with the peace deal with Egypt, Israel started to get uh, significant economic aid. Um, economic aid uh, peaked at like four and a half billion dollars in 1985. So through the 1980s, Israel got economic aid from the United States. And throughout this period, I was saying, Israel does not need economic aid. Zero it out. And indeed, in uh, 2007, um, and, and in 2007, basically Israel, 2008, yeah, Israel's Economic foreign aid was basically zeroed out. I think in 2008, it was $50 million. This is down from, again, a, a peak of $4.5 billion. I Israel does not receive any significant economic aid today. I think it's $5 million right now, and I'm not sure what that is for. It's probably some welfare program that the United States funds. It, I mean, that should be zero. Israel receives two pockets, two forms of aid. So economic aid is zero. Two other forms of aid. One is um, uh, military aid. So straight military aid, they receive around $3.3 billion a year for that. This is, part, this is uh, provided under the Foreign Military Financing Program. This is a fund that requires Israel to use the money, the $3.3 billion, to purchase U.S. military equipment and services. So it has to use the money in order to buy U.S. weapons. So basically what this is, is a U.S. government subsidy to American arms manufacturers, to the in military industrial complex, if you want to call it that. Now, I'm fine with zeroing in that out, but let's just realize what it is. This does not go into the Israeli economy. They do get weapons that they could otherwise not get. But the U.S. economy gets the $3.3 billion going right back. Right? 100% is supposed to be spent in the United States, 100%. Once in a while, they, um, they are permitted to use a portion of it to buy equipment from Israeli defense firms. Right? But on principle, it's supposed to be 100% spent in the U.S. Now, <coughs> there is an additional 500 million a year that is slated for a joint effort between the United States and Israel to develop missile defense systems, missile defense systems, in which the two countries collaborate on research, development, and production of these systems. This is what helped develop and produce the Iron Dome, Iron Dome systems that now the United States is purchasing and using. And, and, and wants to deploy in a variety of different theaters. You can imagine Iron Dome being incredibly valuable in the South Korea theater. You can imagine the Iron Dome being incredibly valuable in the Ukrainian theater, although I don't think it's being used there. David Sling, 
which is, uh, which is uh, for cruise missiles and other type of, of missiles. Now, you know, Iron Dome is for smaller projectiles. David Slings is for uh, drones and uh, cruise missiles. And then the Arrow 2 and 3, which are for ballistic missiles. Now, uh, the United States does not have the equivalent of Iron Dome. It has something like David Sling. Uh, but this is all new tech. Uh, the United States shares in that tech. And therefore, this is not foreign aid. This is a shared investment. Um, and indeed, even uh, Israel's Iron Dome, uh, the projectiles, the missiles that Israel uses for Iron Dome are made by Raytheon. So the United States, as well as buying the projectiles from Raytheon. So as far as aid goes, this is not exactly a drain on the U.S. Treasury. Now add to that, add to that the fact, two, uh, a few other facts. One, Israel is actually fighting America's wars. Israel is actually fighting America's wars. Iran is at war with America has been since 1979. Israel's fighting a war that America should be fighting. Has chosen not to, out of cowardice, pragmatism, lack of self-esteem, all kinds of reasons. Israel's fighting it. So it's doing work for the United States of America. It's protecting American interests. It's holding the Iranians back. With no Israel, Iran would be much more focused and energized around attacking U.S. interests. Two, Israel provides the United States with unbelievable access to intelligence and to military technology, including the testing out of American weapon systems. Where else? American weapon systems, some of the most advanced, used in actual combat. How much has America learned from Israel's use of F-35s? Where else in the world does the F-35 being used in combat? Nowhere. Nowhere. Israel is testing out equipment, using it, and provides massive amounts of feedback back to the United States. Back to the United States. So the United States provides, uh, sorry, Israel provides the United States with massive amounts of feedback on weapon systems and uh, technology and intelligence, uh, which is crucial to American self-interest, crucial to American defense. Israel has also enhanced uh, American weapon system and, again, shares that technology with the United States. Israel develops its own tech. A lot of that is shared with the U.S. So the alliance Israel ha the United States has with Israel is probably the most valuable alliance it has with any country in the world right now. So um, <laughs> you know, it costs three billion dollars out of a budget of four trillion, four plus trillion. It's a cheap price to pay. Cheap price to pay. And again, all that money flows back to U.S. arms manufacturers. So super cheap, super effective, massively valuable to Americans. All right. Um, let me just thank a few people before we go on with a couple of other news items. And then, uh, and then we'll, we'll go to the super chat. Uh, John, thank you for the sticker. Silvanos, thank you for the sticker. Tom, thank you for the sticker. Those are all very generous. Martin from Argentina, thank you for the, for the sticker. Uh, let's see. Tazy and Apollo, thank you. Uh, Vadim, Gale, Jonathan Honing, Fred Harper, Martin again, an anonymous user. And, of course, John, who starts off now every program with a $20 sticker. So thank you, John. Really, really, really appreciate all of that. Uh, thank you, guys. Uh, you you've, you've have been uh, great. All right. Uh, let's look at uh, a, a few other things. So uh, massive um, so massive instability over the weekend because of, uh, because of what happened uh, with Iran in anticipation for that last week. Uh, 
you know, spot gold prices as a consequence spiked again. Uh, they reached uh, 2,350 per ounce, uh, and which is uh, w w these are record levels or close to record levels. Uh, they, I think, uh, again up again. Uh, they're up a little this morning, although off of the record levels. Uh, so gold is going up. I think gold. Oh, sorry, uh, gold hit a record of 2,431. Uh, on Friday, and then uh, in anticipation of the strike, and then when Israel didn't immediately retaliate, it came down a little bit to 2,350. 2, but generally, gold has done very well uh, over the last few months. Uh, and really, two causes for this. Gold is generally considered an inflation hedge, and people buy it with anticipation of infl because of inflation. But I think gold is disappointed for the most part as a pure inflation hedge. Uh, I don't think its performance has matched up to inflation over the last few years. But what gold clearly is, what gold clearly is, is gold is a, um, is a hedge against the end of the world. Gold is a hedge against global instability. Gold is also a hedge against the collapse of the dollar. Gold is a hedge against really, really, really bad outcomes. Uh, and as the world becomes more unstable, as war becomes more prevalent, uh, people rush into gold. It's interesting, they don't rush into Bitcoin. So Bitcoin does not seem to be serve as a very effective store of value or a hedge against inflation or even a hedge against, um, uh, certainly not a hedge against m a macroeconomic event, uh, sorry, geopolitical events. Uh, actually, uh, Bitcoin plummeted uh, uh, with the Iranian attack from uh, 70 something thousand to 65,000. Still very high, uh, but you know, Bitcoin is much more of a speculative asset. And, and I'll, I'll, you know, I'll do a show about my evolving views about Bitcoin. Uh, you, you know, and it's, it's certainly a, a bet on its functionality in the future, but it's not a hedge against anything. It's not a hedge against anything. Gold is. Uh, now you can buy gold at Costco. I don't know if you guys knew this. You can actually go to Costco and buy a bar of gold. You can put it in your shopping cart and check out, which is, I think, pretty cool. I might do that. I don't know if they have that in Puerto Rico. I need to check, but that, that, that seems pretty cool. Okay, so gold is, is reaching highs uh, caused by the real global instability. Every time you get... Wars or struggles when Russia invaded Ukraine, gold spiked, uh, and and every time you get this, um, you get you get a spike up in um, in uh, gold prices. So uh, it is uh, it is uh, it is interesting. It, it, hopefully, you guys own some gold and are benefiting from this. The story I found most stunning. I don't know. This is the most stunning story I have seen in a long time, I think. Remember Zimbabwe? I, I have, I haven't, I, I, I've got it in, in the cupboard behind me, but I'm not gonna stop the show and go get it. I have a hundred trillion dollar note. I think actually Jonathan Honing sent me a couple of hundred trillion dollar notes from Zimbabwe, where Zimbabwe had hyperinflation, you know, uh, uh, what, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, something like that. Well, Zimbabwe has inflation again. Significant inflation. Zimbabwe generally uh, has a, uh, a, a horrible economy. Uh, it's a, a, a massive amounts of poverty. This is a country that uh, used to be the breadbasket of Africa. It, it basically exported massive quantities of food. It basically feed, it barely feeds itself today. Zimbabwe uh, has had these Zimbabwean dollars that's just been worthless. And it's been for a while. There was a period when they did away with the currency and they were using South African Rand, the South African currency, but then they reintroduced the currency and it's been a disaster. Mugabe is dead, but the people who replaced him, well, we don't know because I've got some good news about Zimbabwe. So here's the good news about Zimbabwe. Indeed, shocking, stunning news about Zimbabwe. And maybe this is the beginning of something important. You know, maybe even Millet. Hey, Millet, can you hear me? Maybe even Millet could learn something from Zimbabwe. How about that? Certainly, the Federal Reserve could learn something about Zimbabwe, and maybe this is where the BRICS will ultimately head if they do 
then that would be a revolution, a, a real economic revolution in the world. Zimbabwe is issuing a new currency. It's called the ZIG, Z-I-G. And uh, that is uh, from a, a longer name, which is Zim Gold. The currency is going to be backed by a basket of foreign currencies, gold and precious minerals, dominantly by gold. In other words, Zimbabwe is going on what, right, and what you can, what seems like right now to be a gold backing. Right? Zimbabwe's central bank has launched a new structured currency backed by gold, which is stunning. They've given the population 21 days to convert all the old cash into gold, uh, into this new currency, which is gold. Uh, initially, there were concerns about um, does the Zimbabwe Central Bank have enough gold? Uh, and uh, the, they have uh, disclosed, if you believe them, that they have, uh, let's see, what was it, 1.1 tons of gold um, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in the country, in the vaults of the central bank, and then they have another one and a half tons of gold abroad. Um, they also have uh, precious, precious minerals, such as diamonds, that uh, they could convert into gold, which are worth about 0.4 tons. But basically, uh, this, is, this new currency is going to be supposedly uh, backed by the gold. The central bank, it would adopt a tight monetary policy, linking the money supply growth to growth in gold and foreign exchange reserves. So they will treat foreign exchange uh, as if it's transferred into gold based on the gold the price of gold in that foreign reserve that they have, whether it's euro or dollar or South African rand. I mean, this is massive. This will immediately eradicate inflation from Zimbabwe if people believe that this will actually hold, if they believe the central bank. I mean, a lot of this is about believing them. Uh, inflation was a 55% in March. This could easily drop it to zero. This is the kind of system Argentina should adopt better than even dollarizing the economy. Although the advantage of dollarizing the economy is you get rid of the central bank. Here they're keeping the central bank, and of course the central bank could cheap, cheat, so it would be cool if they actually got rid of the central bank completely. Uh, the new notes, the new bank notes, maybe Jonathan Honing can get us one, uh, actually feature a drawing of gold ingots being minted. Uh, so it actually gets gold on the money. This is the first country going on a gold standard, I don't know, since 1971, as far as I know. This sounds pretty amazing. So this is called the ZIG, Z-I-G, capital G, standing for gold. So I'm excited. Um, I hope this bodes really, really well for Zimbabwe. Of course, Zimbabwe also needs private property and a functioning uh, court system that is actually going to protect, uh, actually going to live up to the rule of law. It needs a lot of things, but this is a huge first step and a massive, massive important step if you want to stabilize uh, your economy. So uh, I'd love to get a zig. I'd love to get my hands on a zig. All right, let's see. I thought that was exciting. I don't know. You guys seem tepid about it, but that's okay. Okay, finally, uh, just to back up my claims about crime. I mean, claiming crime is down, particularly the crime that is most easy to uh, observe, that is to measure, to keep track of, which is homicide. Homicides are reported. Whether this crime is solved or not, we know exactly how many people die because of homicide in, every, in, in cities. And that data is reported pretty quickly. You can get it on a quarterly basis. So we now have the data for the first quarter of uh, for the first quarter of 2024, and the data is quite stunning. That is, uh, homicides have dropped dramatically throughout the United States compared to 2023, and if they can sustain these levels, 
we'll see if that's doable. But if they sustain these levels uh, on a seasonally adjusted basis, because crime always goes up in the summer, but if they sustain this range of levels, then this 2024 could be the least motorous year uh, since 2014. And that was the least motorous year since the 1960s and maybe ever, given uh, how we collect stats. Just to give you a few statistics, in Washington, D.C., which is a horribly violent place and where crime rates have been going up for years, crime, uh, murders declined by 28%. Uh, 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 it, this, is, uh, this is absolute numbers, right? In uh, Philadelphia, murders declined by 34%. In Columbus, Ohio, again, a very relatively high murder rate, murders declined by 58%. On a per capita, per 100,000 basis, again, um, cities have seen massive declines. The largest year-to-date decline um, is in Boston, 82%. Columbus, Ohio, we said 58%. Uh, Austin, Texas, 42%. Basically, the only cities, the only major cities that are seeing an increase in motor rates are Denver, Los Angeles, and Portland. Also rises in homicides as of early April. Now, again, we'll see if this holds for the rest of the year. The number of homicides, uh, you know, in the United States rose significantly in 2020, uh, rose by 30% in 2020, rose again in 2021, a little bit, but stayed at those high levels. And 2022 was down, 2023 it was down, and it looks like 2024 is down significantly. Uh, now, so when Trump tells you there is um, carnage in the streets of America, now you have the facts. You have the actual facts uh, that no, uh, you know, well, uh, you know, the first half of 2022 was the highest homicide rate. Um, actually, no, sorry. 2021 was the highest homicide rate. Uh, in 2022, uh, New Orleans had the highest homicide rate in the United States. And again, that has dropped significantly in 2023. And then again, in the first quarter of 2024. So there is some reason to be somewhat optimistic uh, in terms of murder rates uh, and um, uh, if you look at theft, if you look at Grand Austin, if you look at um, uh, burglaries, I'm, I'm not talking about shoplifting. I'm talking about, uh, a, you know, major theft that is going to be reported, right, that is actually reported. The problem with shoplifting is half of the time it's not even reported. Major theft, uh, violence, assault. Uh, the things are big stuff, all down, all of them down across the board since the peak in 2021. Uh, now, it's true. Shoplifting is up. We talked about that on the Iran Book Show, uh, that stores are shutting down in San Francisco. Stores are putting stuff behind, behind locked uh, cabinets. Uh, shoplifting is, is really high in, in parts of the country. And that is a real problem. It's a real problem that can be dealt with with enforcement. Auto theft is ultimately down from uh, last year. I know it's, it's, yeah, right. Uh, you know, uh, I'd still take the good news. I know you guys having a hard time, uh, having a hard time uh, with uh, taking good news. I know you resist it. I know you, uh, uh, you don't want to hear it, but the reality is that, um, uh, things are getting better in terms of violent crime. And that's the crime that I think is the most problematic, is the most disturbing. Right. All right. Let's see. All right, auto theft. I'm just looking auto theft up. Auto theft uh, was still up in 2023, so we don't have 2024 numbers. Slightly from 2022, uh, but it's been up over the last five years by about a quarter. So don't own a Kia or Hyundai. Those are the, uh, those are the most likely cars to be stolen 
Kias and Hondas uh, from 2003 to 2023, seven times higher likelihood to have your Kia or Hyundai stolen than any other than other brands. Pretty amazing. <laughs> All right. Uh, there must be something about the parts of those cars that can be dismantled. Uh, again, violent crime down across the board. We should celebrate that. We should be happy about that. And the primary reason for that, by the way, is in once the craziness of defund the police ended and uh, cities got reoriented, they started spending more money on police. Uh, once the anarchy of the BLM riots ended, uh, you know, and, and the COVID insanity ended, um, everything, you know, community policing returned, uh, cops returned to their beats, uh, uh, police uh, showed a presence in the cities. Uh, you know, almost no city out there, maybe with the exception of Los Angeles, and indeed Los Angeles, crime rates up. Uh, almost no city has actually took the defund the police seriously, uh, particularly not once crime rates all peaked and went up in 2021. By 2022, they were spending more money on policing and uh, crime was going down. All right. Let's see. All right, we're going to do the Super Chat. A few reminders to everybody. Tonight, I'll be interviewing Tara Smith. We'll be talking about two new books of hers, one on egoism and one on free speech. So tonight, philosopher Tara Smith is going to be in the Ron Book Show, 7 p.m. East Coast time. 7 p.m. East Coast time. Please join us. I think it's going to be a fabulous discussion. Tara is always excellent. It's always fun. We always get into interesting issues. And... Um, yeah, uh, fantastic. So join us uh, join us tonight at 7 p.m. Uh, East Coast time on the Iran Book Show for Tara Smith uh, interview about her two forthcoming books. All right, uh, Ayn Rand Institute is a sponsor of this show. And uh, the Ayn Rand Institute is encouraging you to sign up for Ocon. We've talked a lot about Ocon. Ocon is a fabulous, um, uh, fabulous conference that happens every year. I know many of you have never been. You should go. It is both socially and uh, intellectually an incredibly stimulating, stimulating, uh, stimulating uh, time. Um, so it's um, you know everybody should attend. Uh, you know you can go to uh, einrandorg start here. Uh, to get access, uh, to get access uh, for that, right? All right. Um, today is the scholarship deadline. Today is scholarship deadline. Um, but so I assume everybody who wanted a scholarship has already applied. Right? Uh, another sponsor of the show is Alex Epstein. Epstein, sorry, Alex Epstein, um, you know, and uh, is Energy Talking Points, uh, which features Alex AI. Energy Talking Points gives you concise, powerful, well-referenced arguments on every imaginable energy, environmental, and climate issue. Alex AI, which is part of the premium service, is a cutting-edge chat box. Based on Alex's energy knowledge and thinking methods, Alex AI users, which include many CEOs and members of Congress, use Alex AI to answer their energy questions, help them write speeches, and write social media posts. Uh, you too can get all this knowledge. You can go to alexepstein.substack.com, alexepstein.substack.com, uh, and, uh, and uh, join the most knowledgeable person on issues of energy, climate change, and the environment in the universe, actually in the universe. All right, John, thank you for the sticker. Jeffrey, thank you for the sticker. I appreciate it. Uh, and uh, I, I appreciate uh, all the... Uh, yep, all the many people who refuse to accept statistics because they don't go... Because, I don't know, Biden's in office, so you can't have anything positive happening. And uh, when Trump was in office, you couldn't have anything negative happening. So uh, the fact is, 
uh, violent crime in the United States, violent crime in the United States bottomed out, was the lowest it's probably ever been in history. In 2014, under shock of all shocks, President Obama. And that makes President Obama a great president? No. Why attribute these things to presidents? I, I never understood that. Uh, you know, but, but you need the bad news because the only way Trump can get elected, see, the only way Trump could get elected is to convince the American people that the world is literally falling apart and that he is our savior. And it's the savior attitude. I mean, the Biden administration is awful, awful, horrible, disgustingly so. Um, in spite of that, shockingly, the world is not falling apart. But to actually get elected, you have to convince people that it is. Um, Biden got elected because of the incompetence of Trump. Uh, Trump should have nailed that election. The economy was doing well. Um, he, he completely fubbed and was a complete disaster, complete disaster with COVID. He was a complete disaster with BLM. He was a complete disaster with his Bible in front of the White House. You remember that whole thing? I mean, he just he was just a joke with his with his, uh, you know, drink chlorine. I mean, the guy was a, presented himself as a complete bumbling idiot and he lost. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, he should have won that. He was an incumbent. He had all the advantages of an incumbent. And uh, the only, you know, the economy was doing pretty well. Again, not because of Trump. In spite of Trump, in spite of Biden, the economy does well. Presidents don't get the credit for how the economy does. At the time, I was telling you presidents don't get the credit for how well the stock market go does. Um, it's just not how the world works. Presidents don't have that kind of power. They don't have that kind of influence. Yeah. Ken is still, Ken is, you know, you've got people in the chat who still believe the election was stolen. <laughs> I feel sorry for them. I really do. I mean, you go against reality, against reality, against reality for so much time. You know, it's got to it's got to affect those uh, those brain cells at some point. All right. Uh, let's uh, jump into the super chat. Midas, one hundred dollars. Thank you, Midas. Been listening for about a decade, Yaron. Wow. Never supported. How come? But this month, the 32, I'm finally finishing my BS in finance and have a career lined up in commercial banking. Excellent. So I figured now is the time to start. Thank you for all the content, but more importantly, the inspiration. Thank you, Midas. Really, really appreciate that. Uh, good luck in your banking job. I, I'm curious which commercial bank you're going to work for, uh, but that is terrific. And uh, I completely understand that while being a student and all that, uh, it, it's hard to afford to support the show. Uh, I appreciate the fact that you've been listening and really appreciate the fact that you've been inspired. So that's why I do this. Uh, and thank you. Thank you for the support. All right, Adam, longtime supporter and uh, significant supporter of the Iran Book Show. Iran just got a, a free look at the defense capabilities and procedures of Israel and its allies. The lack of response is cowardice and will continue to embolden inferior enemies. Absolutely. I, you know, this look that they got, I, you know, I don't know how valuable it is. We'll see. But yes, I, it wasn't free. It cost them a lot. Iran is not a rich country. Um, Israel could make it very, very poor by taking out its oil installations. You remember I told you that basically Iran has one big facility where all the exports of oil go through. Israel taking that out, which would not require much at all because it's pretty exposed. Um, it's not like the, uh, you know, you need bunker busting bombs in order to get to the nuclear program. The, 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 the uh, oil is easy, easy and cheap to get rid of. Um, Yes, the lack of response is pathetic, but I can guarantee one thing. Here's, here's my prediction. Whatever Israel does, the one thing it will not do is hurt, damage, destroy Iran's capacity to produce and export oil. Uh, Adam says, free in terms, of, uh, in terms of without consequences. Absolutely, you're right. So far, without consequences. We'll see what they do. I, I, sadly, I think they're going to do something weak. And uh, they're still, they're not going to do it tonight, I don't think. They, they seem to continue to dither. Is dither? Is that a word? It's a real word, right? Sometimes I think I make up words. They, they continue uh, to dither. 
Vadim says, Israel air defense system kind of reminds me of the protective rays at Gold's Coach. Now, okay, uh, almost comic to see evil being impotent against a rational moral society that is Israel. Yes, Israel's technology is not an accident. Israel technology is a consequence, a consequence of, you know, having, uh, being a free society. You don't get technology for free. And by the way, that reminds me uh, that my debate uh, with um, uh, SAFE, uh, the Palestinian libertarian Bitcoin economist, on the Palestinian uh, issue is up. It's, it's out. I, I, I didn't even see it. I don't think he's advertised it even on, on, um, on uh, you know, Twitter. But it is out. Uh, you, so you can find it on uh, Breedlove's um, uh, 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 YouTube channel, Robert Breedlove's YouTube channel. Uh, and uh, yeah, let me know what you think. Three and a half hour long uh, debate on the Israeli-Palestinian issue. Um, and, uh, you know, let me know what you think, how I did. It's not an easy issue to debate. Yeah, I don't see... I really don't see um, that he has tweeted that the debate exists. I, I wonder why. I'll take that as, I don't know, a positive? Because Breedlove is, is, was anti-me. That is the, the moderator. He did a good job moderating, but he made this opening statement that was horrible. Really, really, really bad. Uh, really bad. Uh, and um, you can listen to it. I think it's going to be up there. And uh, yeah, let me know. Uh, let me know what you thought of the debate. But it is out there. He has three hundred sixty-five thousand followers. Wow, on Twitter. I don't know about YouTube. Uh, last I looked, it had like four thousand views. But uh, it would be great if you watch it and comment on it. Please comment on it. In in in. And if you think I I made some good points, comment in my favor. All right. Um, all right. Let's see. Whoops. That's kind of, yeah. It's interesting that he, he's, not, he's, not, he's not tweeting it. All right. Um, Jeffrey says, in honor of tax day, how were taxes collected in early America, especially late 19th century? Well, there was no, there was no um, income tax, right? Income taxes were basically unconstitutional, viewed as unconstitutional back then. So there was no income tax. So there was no, uh, you know, filing taxes on a April 15th. There was no withholding tax now, all of that is a modern modern creation uh, most taxes uh, were uh, various forms of tariffs importation taxes uh, there were all kinds of other uh, transactional taxes so they were collected primarily at custom houses in the border uh, and uh, by uh, states states had a variety of different taxes and I'm not sure how they were collected at the state level but remember you know, there was very, very little, uh, there was very, very little taxation. The federal government spent less than 5% of GDP. So it spent, in some cases, close to 3% of GDP. The entire government apparatus, state, local, and federal, spent significantly less than 10%. So you can imagine the taxes were very, very low to the extent that they happened. But uh, there were no income taxes with the exception of the Civil War uh, but those income taxes were ruled unconstitutional. There were other attempts to introduce income taxes that failed, and it took amending the Constitution in order to get the income tax in 1914. So uh, Americans did not have to keep receipts, have deductibles, stuff like that. There were some forms of corporate taxation, some forms of corporate taxation. So corporations still had to do it, but individuals did not. Individuals did not. Thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, Shazbot, a term you could use, lollygagging, to fool around and waste time, lollygagging. Lollygagging sounds too frivolous to talk about, you know, when people's lives are at stake. Oh, they're lollygagging. I don't know. Doesn't flow off the tongue easily. Thank you, Shazbot. <laughs> All right, let's see. I've got a lot of questions from, um, still from uh, Saturday. 
uh, which I will get to some of them today and then some of them I'll delay for tomorrow. I just don't have the time to cover all of them. By the way, good news, bad news for you, I don't know, but we will be shifting to a new schedule starting tomorrow. Uh, Monday's always going to be like this. There'll be a, a, a one o'clock or two o'clock news show and then in the evening a debate, uh, a interview. But every other day is now going to be from two to four, two to five. So there'll be plenty of opportunities. Actually, I'm going to delay all the questions for Saturday to tomorrow. I'll answer them all tomorrow because tomorrow's going to be a long show. We're going to go till four or five o'clock tomorrow. Um, targets in terms of uh, uh, super chats, just so you know. Monday will be the same, 250, 650. Uh, 250 for the news roundup, 650 for the afternoon. Um, other days will be 700. Uh, the, the, uh, for the total show. So I will do the first hour will be News Roundup, and then uh, I will do another topic. In the title of the show, you will see that starting tomorrow. There will be just News Roundup and a date, and then after that, it will be, um, it will be, um, it will be the, the, the topic, the bigger topic that we're discussing. Uh, the bigger topic that we're discussing. It's going to be, from 2 p.m. until somewhere between 4 and 5 p.m. East Coast time. So at least two hours of content every day, uh, potentially three hours of content every day. How long it goes will depend completely on you and on uh, how many questions you have. Um, I know that this is not ideal for all of you, but this is probably going to be the schedule through the summer. If... It, if it turns out that it's not as good as the current schedule in terms of money raised, in terms of number of people watching live, then I will shift back to the old schedule in the fall. But in the summer, I might not be in the United States for a, a lengthy period of time, and it will be impossible for me to do the current schedule given time zones. So this is a schedule that I'm going to start now, and if I, if I indeed land up not being in the United States during the summer, this will be uh, this will be much more convenient uh, uh, for me, or not convenient, make it possible for me to do the show uh, even while I'm traveling. All right, all the questions from Saturday will be answered tomorrow during this very long show that I will be doing, and I'll be doing this very long show every single day, Tuesday through Friday. Monday will be a news roundup, and then uh, interview. And tonight, don't forget interview with Tara Smith, a philosopher, Tara Smith. Uh, on egoism and on free speech. Two topics. All right, Mary Aline, uh, you are right. Biden told Israel not to strike back. So frustrating, angry, makes me crazy. I agree, Mary Aline. Um, just because I know what's going to happen doesn't mean I'm happy about the fact that I'm right. Because I, I said Biden would do this, and I said Netanyahu would cave. Uh, Robert Nasser, um, YBS Freedom. Meanwhile, I'm waiting for Israel to do what the United States of America would do if we were ever attacked on our soil in this way. I hope that's true. I hope the United States would actually respond properly if it was attacked on its soil. It's not obvious to me. Certainly, the United States did not do what is necessary after 9-11. Not even close. Not even semi-close. Go read End States That Support Terrorism um, by Leonard Peikoff, written in, uh, I think it was published in November of 2001, after 9-11. Go read that again. And uh, you tell me that the United States, even when attacked on its own soil, does what is necessary. It does not. The wimpiness extends far beyond Israel, definitely to America, including the American people themselves. Uh, after 9-11, we attacked the wrong people in the wrong place, stayed too long, did it all wrong from beginning to end. Mary Aline, it was a win for Iran because the U.S. wouldn't let Israel strike back. Yes, I, I agree with you. And, and the, what they're seeing is how weak Israel actually is, that it will succumb, succumb. Um, Uh, prop up. I saw on the anti-regime Iranian forum on Reddit that they were posting addresses of mullahs and regime members calling for Israel to strike them. Absolutely. 
I mean, as I said on Saturday, the Iranians want Israel to weaken this regime so that they can have a free country. They would love for Israel to target the mullahs. And I would love for Israel to target the mullahs. I would love for America to target the mullahs. Alas, it ain't happening. It is not happening. Urban Porcupine, is it possible that the run up in gold prices over the last 30-ish years has to do with the rise of conservative talk shows and the fact that every one of them aggressively advertises a gold broker? No, I mean, the reality is that gold prices rose before the last 30 years. Uh, gold prices spiked and, and peaked at the time in uh, the early 1980s, uh, and then they crashed when interest rates went up and inflation was devastated, and then they slowly rose again, and then they rose again uh, during the financial crisis, but uh, it, it, even as people like Peter Schiff was expecting them to go through the roof, they actually stabilized and went, then went down, and then they rise every time there's political uncertainty. They rise every time when there's economic uncertainty. They rise every time when there's inflation or, or, or some economic catastrophe, or certainly geopolitical catastrophes, they always rise. So they, they, it's very predictable in that sense uh, the, the, what is going to happen with gold. Uh, so, no, I don't think it has anything to do with marketing. A gold market is too deep. It's too extensive for that to actually be happening. Tom, do you think Iran will be less useful to Russia as a weapons supplier because of this? No, I don't think so. I mean, uh, 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 Russia can still use hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of drones. Uh, that's what they're buying from the Iranians in order to overwhelm the Ukrainians. They can't do it maybe with the Israelis, partially. You know, there are two reasons here. One is, uh, you know, Ukraine just doesn't have the F-35s and the F-16s and the F-15s that Israel has that can knock these things out of the air before they even reach the target. But secondly, Ukraine is much closer to Russia, much closer to Russia than Israel is to Iran. So Israel has a lot of warning before the drones reach it, and it has a lot of airspace. It basically controls the airspace in Syria, and the Jordanians let it operate above their airspace. So it had a lot of room to operate, to operate, right? So uh, uh, that is not the case for Ukraine. So Russia will still be buying hundreds of, th actually thousands of drones from the Iranians, unfortunately. Shazbat, will Tara Smith be providing us all with handouts during the interview? I don't think so. She always does that with lectures, but not for the interview. I think, you know, I think she provided me with a handout, but not you. <laughs> all right, James says, are you going to read all Super Chats from yesterday? Yes, but not today. I will do that tomorrow in the show. Tomorrow's show will be at 2 p.m. We'll go until 4 or 5 p.m., and I will be reading and answering all the questions from yesterday's Super Chat, oh, Saturday's Super Chat on the show tomorrow. Uh, James goes on, how did Jordan, how will Jordan be viewed by other Arab countries for helping Israel? Will Iran expand in Asia? Um, I mean, a lot of the Arab countries helped Israel. It wasn't just Jordan. Supposedly, Saudi Arabia provided intelligence. Uh, Egypt, interestingly enough, actually turned down U.S. Requ requ request to join in the fight and knock down some of the missiles being launched from, uh, from uh, the Houthis, which uh, Egypt would have the ability to do. Uh, so Egypt did not join in. Uh, I, you know, I think Jordan is, Jordan's trouble is that it has already a peace deal with Israel, and the Palestinians really hate it, and some Arab states do, but Arab leaders generally have moved to, a, at least in the short run, to a pro-Israel position. So... Um, I don't think it affects Jordan one way or the other. Uh, will Iran expand in Asia? No, Iran's not going anyway. Iran is a poor country. It, has, it does not have a strong military. It has a lot of missiles. It has a lot of drones. And it has no, nothing else. It, 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 it has no real military capabilities. It can't expand anywhere. Uh, indeed, it, it should fear that if it tries, other countries might bite into its own territory. So no, Iran's not expanding anywhere. Its influence expands because it inspires the jihadis. It inspires the Islamists it, it, because it's the one country ruled by Sharia law. 
that stands up to the West and gets away with it. So next terrorist attack could very well be caused in the West, could very well be caused by the fact that Israel did not respond. Because Israel in the West appear weak, that elevates Iran, that inspires Islamists all over the world to go after the West. All right. I will see you all tonight at 7 p.m. East Coast time. Thank you for the super chatters. You were great. We, we uh, easily beat our target. And remember, tomorrow, 2 p.m., long show, two to three hours. Monday, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. We're on a schedule now. All right. Uh, so you can set your clocks. You can set your timers. You can join. Um, no excuses. I'm not moving it around, except when I will be, <laughs> when I travel. But when I'm home, it's always in the same time, same place. Uh, and yeah, Catherine just uh, uh, did a, uh, a sticker. Thank you, Catherine. Shelley, thank you. And Catherine reminded me, just a, a quick news story. Um, Catherine was posting about this, I think, earlier. The, um, there are protests, pro-Hamas protesters, all over the United States blocking the pass to airports. If you, go, if you miss your flight in the next few days, if you're in a parking jam outside of Chicago O'Hare Airport and you're going to miss your flight, you can thank the pro-Hamas demonstrators. But really, who you should thank is your local police force for not clearing these bastards out, for not clearing them out, arresting them, throwing them in jail. Um, it, 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 this has been going on for too long. These protests, the, 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 the tolerance for these protests is absurd and ridiculous. The government needs to shut them down. Actually, wasn't this, this was a Gale story. Was it Gale or Catherine? <laughs> now I'm confused. Why am I confusing Gail and Catherine? Um, all right, it was Gail. Sorry, Catherine, you don't get the credit for this one. Gail gets the credit for this one. Uh, she tweeted on it and she mentioned it on the chat. So thank you, Gail, uh, for thank you, Gail, for <laughs> for uh, providing me with the uh, with a link to it. Uh, it really is disgusting. It really is ridiculous. Uh, you know, uh, law enforcement needs to shut down these protests. It needs to shut down these protests as, as quickly as possible. And uh, they, they need to use force to do it. And uh, airports, shutting down airports, I mean, it, it truly is outrageous and a massive violation of the rights of all those people trying to get to a plane, trying to get on vacation, trying to get business to see their kids, see the grandkids, whatever, right? All right, everybody, I will see you all tonight, 7 p.m. Don't forget.